we're being recorded. Okay, continue. Let me just have to click continue. Okay, today is March 10th, 2022. And pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so um, following the link or the dial-in instructions on the Board of Health agenda that is on our website. Um, no in-person attendance will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite the best efforts, we will post on the Amherst Board of Health website an audio recording of our, of our meeting as soon as possible. And the minutes will be posted after they are accepted. So with that, I open tonight's Board of Health meeting and I'll have a roll call. So Steve? Here. Tim? Here. Maureen? Here. Ne uh, Lauren? Here. Uh, Nancy? Here. And Jen is our health director who is here. And we have Ed Smith from Inspectors. So the first article of business is uh, reviewing and receiving the minutes from our February 10th meeting. I've read them. Anybody have any comments after reading them? If not, may have a motion to accept them as presented to us. Uh, I just want to say I have a new email, so I wasn't able to read the minutes. So I don't know. Okay, then you don't don't just abstain okay. from voting. Okay. okay. So may have a motion to accept the minutes, and then make sure you get get the uh, email to us, Lauren. Okay. Um, uh, okay, I can make a motion to accept the minutes of February 10th. I'll second. As it's written. Okay, so it's moved and seconded. Um, all in favor? Steve? Aye. Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Nancy? Aye. And Lauren? Staying. Staying. Okay, great. Okay, so now we are going to have a 20 minute public comment, but let me just say a few things before. So residents are welcome to express their views for up to two minutes at our discretion based upon the number of people who wish to speak. The board will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. During the public comment period, um, either I or uh, Jennifer uh, Brown will recognize members of the public. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and your address of residence. We will be reserving the initial comment period to town residents and business owners first. So thank you. And with that, I'm gonna open up the public comment minute. period. All right. Um, so town residents, so we're gonna ask people to state their um, address and please, if you can say your full name. So Amherst residents. So I'm gonna start with Isolda Ortega Bustamante and please correct my pronunciation and you're able to talk, please. Good evening, thank you. I'm a District 5 resident of Amherst and I wanna thank all of you for your work on behalf of all of us residents of Amherst. I emailed you a full letter, uh, which hopefully you all received. If you did not, um, Ms. Brown has uh, copies of it. And I'm only going to refer to a couple of highlights in the time so that others will have an opportunity here. Um, I appreciate that the town uh, felt the need to produce its own recalculation of local vaccination date per age group by excluding local college students whose vaccination numbers were said to have been reported in their hometowns, and that this took time and effort. 
Um, what I'm wondering is what are the next steps for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health to certify this local repopulation and to start including it in its own official municipal vaccination reporting, which it currently does not do. And in, in particular, what are the plans for updated reporting on the local vaccination rates by race and ethnicity? Because I won't cite the ones from the state um, as I wanna respect the work that you did in pointing out that the state rates were lower because they included college students, but we don't have an update on that. And given the national and state trends, which do show disparities, um, on the one hand, we would you know, love to know that given our stated commitment to equity. On the other hand, there are state funds available for targeted campaigns for education vaccination. And our board of health, like any local board of health is really stretched trying to meet all of its work. And we have wonderful elected officials like Representative Mindy Dom and Senator Joe Comerford, who are champions on these issues and could work with all of you and our elected officials to tap into more state funding for this kind of work. I will skip on down as I don't want to take up too much time. Okay, two minutes are up, Isolde. Can I just add that? Let me just add that this is not the time to change the vaccine mandate because college students will be spreading all over the nation to low vaccination locations and returning at the end of the month. And so we really should expand. Uh, we should continue the mask mandate until at least the end of the month so the college students have a chance to come back and recover given the number of cases at Amherst College and UMass in particular. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. Um, stick to two minutes if possible. Okay. Um, next in line, we have Darcy Dumont. If you can state your name, your address, please. And please unmute yourself. Hello. About, um, about vaccination, about uh, masks, right? Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm Darcy Dumont. I live in South Amherst and I'm a member of Zero Waste Amherst. As you know, I've been working with others on the proposal to transition our waste hauler system to one of a contract with the hauler, which includes compost pickup and costs residents much less. This is just a brief update on the actions we've taken in the last month. Um, I am going to, uh, as Isolde did, skip over some parts of my uh, written comment um, about what's happening globally uh, and just focus on what we're, we have been doing locally. This month, ZWA work group uh, again met with staff from other towns to learn more about their services and costs. Uh, we have an appointment next week to meet with Louisville, Colorado's EcoCycle to find out more about their compost pickup program rates and costs. And I just want to point out an example of the difference between Louisville and Amherst is that if I lived in Louisville, which has a contract with Republic Services, I would be paying $16 a month for trash, recycling, and compost pickup. Here I pay USA hauling and recycling $55 a month for exactly the same service, including their optional curbside compost pickup. So Z CWA also started to meet with town councilors to educate them and gain their support. And we're having good success in speaking with them. Um, we also spent time meeting with Susan Waite, former Amherst Sustainability Coordinator and current DEP Western Region Municipal Assistance Coordinator to delve deeper into a whole array of different related issues. Um, and again, CWA is promoting this proposal because it will dramatically reduce our waste and help it help achieve our climate and zero waste goals. The fact that Thank it, you, Darcy, can you summarize that quickly and absolutely. your time is up? Yes, okay. the, fact, the fact that the proposal will save residents money is uh, just an added um, big benefit. So we'd be glad to answer any questions and otherwise we will see you next month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darcy. All right, so the next person I'm gonna call on, um, if you can state your name and your address, please. And Gabrielle Gould, can you please uh, unmute? And you have two minutes. 
Good afternoon, I'm Gabrielle Gould. I am the Executive Director of the Business Improvement District and I'm speaking on behalf of the majority of small businesses throughout Amherst. Our high vaccination rate is, in, is incredible compared to other small towns. Our small businesses have suffered greatly through this pandemic with their businesses dropping to as low as 20%. They have rarely seen close to pre-pandemic numbers in their businesses since the start of this. It is time our businesses need a sense of normalcy to return. I cannot be, they have been policing themselves the mask mandate since the beginning. It is very difficult for them. 70% of the businesses in Amherst are minority LGBTQ plus or women owned. A large percentage of those are English as a second language. This has been a very, very difficult time for them and they are not the ones that should be policing these issues. Um, as we look at every town around us dropping their mask mandates, it makes it that more imperative that our mask mandate be lifted for these small businesses. It becomes harder and harder for them every day. The great thing is, is that we can all make personal choices to wear masks if we are concerned going forward. And I'm sure because of the town that we live in and what I've seen, people will continue to wear their masks long after this mandate is lifted, including many of the business owners themselves. Please understand that we respect and know that you have done the work and the research and that the decision you make today, we will support fully as we have since the very beginning of this pandemic, but it is time our businesses need this. We need a return to normalcy. Our vaccine rates show that and so do the colleges and our public schools and the university's vaccine rates. We can do this. Thank you so much for everything you all do and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I'm trying to take people in order and I'm sorry this gets shuffled around. Uh, Marissa Axtell, you were at the top of the list and somehow I moved you to the bottom. You can say your full name please and your street address and please unmute in just two minutes. All right, hi, um, my name is Marissa Axtell and my address is 237 Meadow Street. I live in North Amherst. Um, I, was going to say a lot of what Gabri uh, Gabriella just said, so I'm not going to repeat myself, but I am here to advocate for you to lift the mask mandate. I have sent many emails to Jennifer, so you can see a lot of the articles and um, scientific information I've sent in regards to that. But I have a son who is five years old in kindergarten and he is struggling with having to learn to read other kids' emotions and everything that comes along with being a student in elementary school. So if anything, this mask mandate is really hurting our younger population that is not as affected by COVID. So they should have the choice of what doing, what is right for their family, and they can choose to wear a mask or not choose to wear a mask. So I don't have much more to say. I won't take the whole two minutes up, but please, consider the youngest members of our community with the mask mandate today. Thank, Thank you. you, Marissa. Kristen Ari Gemma, um, if you can please pronounce your name correctly where you live and you have two minutes. Kristen? If you can unmute. Okay, don't count that though. You hear me? <laughs> Hello? Hello, yes. Yes. now we hear you. Okay, don't, okay. My name is Kristen Ori Gemma and I have, I am an ADA uh, person during this pandemic. And I think it's like super, super creepy. I got screamed at on the top of people's lungs and I believe it's the hate that comes with the mandates. Um, I believe that it's all about perspective and people, I believe that the Board of Health switched places with the the restaurants and the restaurants is places with the board of health for one month, they would understand each other. It's all about perspective and it's just, it's just wrong and people should just do what they think is best. And I don't know how much longer you think you can get away with punishing people because when people are not scared of punishment anymore, what are you going to do? <laughs> so I say, I say, if you want everyone to follow the rules, make rules everyone can follow. Everyone deserves to be healthy. No one deserves to be left behind. The future accepts everyone. And I think, and it's not about what I think, it's just, if it's the hate that came with the mandates. And I see this as, um, 
if this is how we treat each other, are we really existence worth saving? <laughs> So anyway, people can look on my YouTube channel, Kristen Ori Gemma, simply spell that. I also have a bibliography on, on what it was like during the pandemic for a disabled person. Um, I lived off peanut butter for a long time. Um, I forgot what it was like to be inside, um, but the homeless community saved my life. It's only because of them that I'm still here today. Thank you, Kristen. Susan Lowry, if you can please unmute, state where you live, please. You have two minutes. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Susan Lowry. I'm a retired physician and I live in South Amherst. And I am here to ask you to hold on to the indoor mask mandate through the end of the month uh, until the students have returned and also had a chance to recover from the viruses that they will no doubt bring back from the many places that they go. Uh, the problem with lifting the mask mandate, in my opinion, is that people will also forget about the other two legs of the stool that help to keep us safe. And I believe that social distancing will also stop as well as large gatherings will resume and that will not serve our town well and will cause further delays in businesses recovering. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. So I'm gonna to go to, um, I see a name without a full name. Um, so, Peter, if you can please state your full name and if you're an Amherst resident where you live and you have two minutes. Uh, yes, my name is uh, uh, Peter Kent Stahl. I'm an Amherst resident, an Amherst employee. Um, yeah, I just want to say that I agree. What? Disappeared. I am so sorry. Can you raise your hand again? Things just got shuffled around and I was cleaning up and I started. There it is. Okay, I see it again. Peter, I apologize. Okay, no worries. Can you hear me? Yeah, and I'll start your time over again. Okay, no problem. So I just want to say that I do, I agree that we should maintain the mask mandate for now. Um, COVID continues to be a leading, if not major, cause of death. Um, there are numerous places where people can, you know, can choose to not wear masks, but just maintaining the mask mandate in public spaces, I think will keep us safe. I agree with the last comment from the physician and the first comment. No one wants to, of course, wear a mask forever, but we just have to also be, we have to be, um, we have to be sensitive about local dynamics, right? And, and realize that there's, uh, I, 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 there's massive people moving in and out of the town because of the college, right? And we have to be realistic and know that that is going to cause a spike in cases. We just have to be realistic about that. We can't, federal guidelines are important, but we also have to just be specific and be realistic about what we know is going to happen when people move in and move out of town in mass, right? Um, and again, that doesn't mean that, that anybody wants to have to do this forever, but I think that we do need to be safe and maintain it at least for now um, and continue to try to push the curve downward. And this will give us more time as well um, to make sure we are on guard and to make sure that the BA2 variant uh, does not cause an additional spike. And this gives us, a, a, this gives us uh, I guess, buying time is the right order. This just gives us an additional layer of protection to hopefully ride that out and to make sure that that doesn't cause uh, an additional spike. So I think keeping these public health precautionary principles in place right now will serve us best. Um, we know that two-way masking works better. There, that The science is clear on that. It's Masking is not about, it is it, it's a public health policy, meaning it, it's best when it's collectively practiced. That is a fact. One-way masking, depend, asking people who are more vulnerable to one-way mask uh, for, for their own choice, that's just does, that does not work as well as two-way masking, and that is clear. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, Alicia Reed, if you can please unmute um, and state where you live in your two minutes. Sure. So, hi, I'm Alicia Reed. Uh, I'm a resident of South Amherst. Um, and, you know, the main thing I want to say is that I, I sincerely hope that these decisions in terms of the mask mandate are not being based on personal views or kind of feelings about, you know, what they, people would like to happen. Um, I really hope that we're looking at CDC guidelines and, and simply deciding that we are going to go with what the experts have said. And when we look at the new county tool that they have put out, it is clear that despite being in a college community, despite cases among our students, we are still in what's considered a medium risk uh, community, right? And one in which we should not be requiring masks. And so that's that's really all that I ask is that, you know, <laughs> People have individual choices. I'll also add that I'm, I'm UMass faculty. I am around these students um, day to day, even with the mask mandate having been lifted a couple of days ago, they all walked into my lab meeting with masks on, right? They're still being very responsible by and large. And so, you know, to, to expect our youngest children, I have two elementary school kids to continue to mask uh, while my husband teaches in a school, you know, 20 minutes away that is not masked. I, I think it's the time has come and, and it's really time for us to stop being extra conservative uh, rather than simply following the guidelines that others have set. Thank you. And thank you very much. Nancy, how are we doing with time? Okay, let's see. Oh, we could probably do three more. Okay, so we have um, Cora Fernandez Anderson. If you can unmute yourself, um, state where you live and you have two minutes. Hello, yes, I'm Cora Fernandez Anderson. I live in Echo Hill in Amherst. And I also have two children in Fort River in elementary school. And um, I would like to support um, the position of keeping the mask mandate until for now, probably, you know, until at least mid April, late April. I think uh, particularly because of the impact this will have on the public schools, I am concerned that our children are spending, you know, six hours inside a classroom. And that if, uh, you know, we have no mask mandate and there is some positive person within them, it's like, even if you wear a mask, it's such so much exposure that there might be, you know, um, uh, risk of, of, of getting uh, infected. Um, I would really appreciate if we can wait until the weather is a little warmer. So there can be, you know, classrooms can be held, uh, classes can be held outside. There can be opening windows because of warmer weather, things that like now I don't really see possible. So just like postponing it like some weeks, I think it will give teachers um, a little bit more, you know, uh, uh, other uh, access to other measures to you know have better ventilation and more activities outside so as to be more on, on the cautious side um, and uh, as somebody else said also I think it's important definitely if even if you decide to lift the mandate um, at least to wait until after a spring break and all you know college students are back maybe for a week um, so if there's is an increase in cases because of traveling and moving to other places, uh, we still have the protection of the masks um, and uh, and see how, how the cases evolve. So uh, I'm not saying we have to keep masks forever, but I think uh, just waiting some more at least weeks um, can can make a difference uh, to face it with, with better, better protections and, and warmer weather. Thank you. Thank you. Brooks Ballinger, uh, if you can state your full name and where you live, and I think you're the last person to talk. You have two minutes. Hi, um, Brooks Ballinger. I live in South Amherst, um, and um, I just wanted to thank the the uh, the board for what they're doing. Um, I feel like I've been protected because you guys did this important work, and. Um, and it, it makes me understand where I should go and where I shouldn't go. Um, you know, if there are businesses that um, just think that it's, um, it's their individual choice, whether they follow the rules or not, that's not a business I want to go to. Um, and I know that um, the board has um, uh, been screamed at and probably worse. I don't know all the details, but I know it's a very difficult position that you're in. And um, I just really appreciate what you do. And I think you make me and everybody else in Amherst safer because you are curious and careful and take this seriously. So thanks. Thank you very much. We can do another one we still have. Okay. Uh, the Matthew Lackner, if you can unmute yourself. 
where do you live? And you have two minutes. Hi, thank you for letting me speak. I appreciate it. Um, I live in District 5. Uh, I'm the parent of a seven-year-old, a five-year-old who go to Port River and a two-year-old who goes to Woodside. Um, I'm here to advocate for the mask mandate to end immediately uh, for three reasons. Uh, first of all, um, there is no data showing that mask mandates actually impact community transmission rates. Masks, of course, work. They protect the, the wearer if it's a good mask. Uh, but if you look at counties with and without mandates, there's no difference in transmission and there's no data to back that up. Um, even without the data, we can use common sense. This is my second reason. Right now in Amherst, I can go to a restaurant or a bar and I cannot wear a mask while I eat and drink. I can teach a class at UMass, which I do to 300 undergrads, none of whom are wearing a mask. I can go to the UMass hockey game, which I did a week ago, where there's 5,000 people who can take off their masks to eat and to drink. So the mask mandate defies all common sense from the perspective of actually slowing transmission. Now, as an adult, you know what? I could suck this up. I could wear a mask when I go to Big Y. It's fine. The problem with the mask mandate is that it's punishing the people in town who have the least amount of power, which is children. My children go to school. They wear masks for six hours a day. They were discussing the other day which of their friends' faces they could pick out and which they forgot which they looked like. That's not a discussion that five and seven year olds should be having with each other. So to me, the mask mandate, uh, you know, its impact on adults, whatever, but the impact on children is simply unacceptable. And I think it's time for the town to end the mask mandate, let children get back to having a normal life at school. They've been spending two years bearing the brunt of this pandemic, despite the fact that they're the safest people from this disease. And it's time for this end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're exactly at 529. Okay, so thank you to all the public comments. And now um, we're going to move on to old business right now and the recombinant DNA regulations. We, because of tonight's meeting, we have put those off until our April 21st meeting and we've moved the meeting. We'll discuss. Uh, to the 21st because Thursday is Holy Thursday and people like to go to services so to keep it open to the public and the next day is Good Friday and there's Passover in there so we've just moved it for a week and I hope that's all right with you and with Maureen and Georgia and Steve I mean okay um, because community assessment update um, I met yesterday with Lillian and our two UMass students who are doing an amazing job. Right now, they are really focusing on health data because the demographics are not being released by the Census Bureau until March 17th. And not all of them will be even released then, just some have been released. Um, so they are using data from 2010 and 2018 and 2019. They're making graphs. They're making graphs by um, some chronic diseases by census tract. And it's very impressive what they're coming up with. They're going to be moving to demographics after the 17th. We met with uh, Michelle Miller from the African Heritage Committee. And they are doing a, a, a um, community assessment very similar to ours with demographics and then more qualitative, quantitative, qualitative material in phase two. And we're trying to get the okay because they are using the Donahue Institute. The town is paying for that for us to pick back on some of that data that the Donahue Institute um, can generate. I also met with um, Haley Bolton from the Senior Center because they are doing a community assessment, but they're really not focusing on demographics or health status. There is, theirs is more qualitative, um, what we might be collecting in phase two. So they'd be happy to sh for us to share our demographic data with them and they will share their qualitative data with the uh, older uh, population with us. So that's where we are now. And if you have any questions, I'll 
answer them. Okay. So next on the agenda is Ed Smith with the Mission Cantina update. Hi, um, I'm just gonna read some notes. Um, so since the last meeting, which was I think the 10th of February, uh, our office has received no further complaints for Mission Cantina. On the 23rd of February, we have received documents that comprised a complete renewal application for the food service license for that establishment. And a 2022 permit was issued. Today, uh, at March 10th, there was a show cause hearing of the Eastern Hampshire District Court. The clerk magistrate heard testimony from the town and the restaurant owner who had appealed the tickets that we had assessed. And after due consideration, the magistrate directed the owner to obey regulations and to seek appropriate avenues when in disagreement with them. And with the town's assent, the, the fines were dismissed. Thank you, Ed. Does mm -hmm. anyone have questions for Ed? Okay. Thank you. So we'll move on and you'll be on this, Ed, the geothermal well permit application for 124 Linden Ridge Road sure. that we've all received in our packet. Yeah, the geothermal wells are fairly straightforward. Um, I did go out and visit the site. The locations are um, clearly marked. They are um, there's a little bit of flexibility. One of them is near the front property line. Uh, it's still 10 feet off by my best, you know, guess. And there's enough, um, well, the, that's not a guess. The, the pins are, are visible, the surveyor stakes. Um, and the driller, which is Connecticut Valley Artesian uh, Wells, has the ability to adjust things a couple feet one way or another in order to maintain a 25 foot separation between the two boreholes. This project has two um, and uh, I really don't see any issues with the siting. Um, and so I, I am supporting the, the location. Okay, thank you. We have a motion to accept the application for the well construction. So I have a question before we make okay. a motion. Yes. Um, I think usually for the wells, uh, we need to know the floodplain. I don't know if the, uh, it should be 100 feet from the floodplain. You know? So I'm just wondering uh, if there is a um, bankful type of a um, location from the wetland and the distance from that location to the well itself. There is a wetland. Uh, to the rear of the property. Um, let's, I'm not sure of the direction without looking at the map to the um, northwest. And there's a 100 foot wetland offset that's shown on the map. And that is quite a ways from the back of the house. And then the first well is at the front of the house. Does, does that answer your question? Um, um to some extent, you know, the, we need to, I mean, there is a wetland regulation mm -hmm. on private water wells should be at least 25 feet from the high water mark. And uh, the water mark is very difficult to assess with the 100 feet distance. So that's why I'm asking if there is any um, high water mark mapping or anything, you know, overlaid on the top of this. Oh, okay. Um, it's a steep hill down to the stream in the back. So do you mean high groundwater or high mark for the stream itself? Uh, high water mark on the surface water, not surface. for the groundwater. Usually for the flat, flat plain maps, it's uh, 100 feet, I mean, 100, uh, flat, you know, event, you know, uh, so I don't know if uh, one, 100 year return period type of a mapping is overlaid and checked on that. I didn't look at that, I certainly can. Um, 
yeah, the, I, I think it is good to check that one, the high water mark I think uh, from that high water mark it should be within, I mean it should be beyond that 25 feet uh, limit by the wetland protection. So, another one concern I have is the, the distance from the, uh, the property line at the front, it is very close to 10 feet, uh, 10 feet I think. So I am just looking at this rough numbers here, 40 feet and um, so if I deduct the distance from that property to the well itself, 25 feet, you know, it, 4 inches, I am just curious, you know, if it is 10 feet or around 10 feet, you know, so it, it might be very close, mm -hmm. so, but you, you can check that one. Yeah, and that is why I did ask the owner if he had, you know, leeway to change the, the location and he will shift that. Um, okay. the, mark, the front marking pins are still quite visible. I have a question. This is a more general question and reveals my ignorance, but are uh, the same rules that apply to water wells apply to geothermal drill, you know, drill, drilling? The board of the Amherst Board of Health local regulations for wells are um, gather more information uh, and there's notification for neighbors when you're drilling a water well and there's a follow up process to issue a water supply certificate. Uh, and that looks into the, the testing that's done for flow rates and capacity for the well and the water quality. So those things all get reported back. Um, to, to me when I'm closing out the permit. And then um, if everything is there, then um, that would lead to the water supply certificate. Um, also, when you're applying for a water, a drinking well, then you notify your neighbors. You have a statement that describes the history of the land, the past uses, um, but also has, includes any uh, possible threat to the water supply um, in the sense like um, say there's a utility building with fuel storage within 10 feet or something that would certainly be something that you wanted to uh, to indicate um, but the geothermal well application is more like an agricultural well it is more of a you know present the the details of the contractor um, that he's licensed with the state, um, the location by mapping. Um, the, okay. That's the bulk of it. Thank you. So the siting is the same, but there are other things about water, well, with drinking water that are more complex. The siting is, I believe, the same. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other is, it possible, for Ed? is it possible for us to approve it subject to the high watermark criterion? I'd be happy to operate on that um, sort of an approval that I can, in fact, communicate with Tim um, and answer his question or answer it to the whole board, whatever your pleasure is. Is that okay with you, Tim? Does that seem good? Yeah. Well, how about I'll move that we approve it subject to res resolving the issue about the high water criteria. I can second it. It's been moved and seconded to approve this pending the answer to the high water uh, mark. Um, all in favor? Tim? Aye. Steve? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Lauren? I'm going to abstain. Okay, Nancy, aye. Okay. So, thank you yeah. very much. Now we will have the director's update. All right, so I'm going to start out with item A's. I've labeled it communication to the health department. 
And I just want to take a few minutes and talk to the board and everybody about the communications we've been receiving here. Um, a lot of uh, emails and phone calls um, regarding the mass mandate, very strong opinions on both sides. And these comments are very appropriate. They're very welcome. I think it's really important that, you know, as someone who works for the town, that I know how our decisions and our policies affect the people that live here and work here, go to school here. I think it's especially important for uh, the mask mandate. Um, every message regarding the mask mandate, I've read them, I've heard you, and I really take them into consideration you know, as we examine all the data in the CDC and the DPH guidance. But there have been emails, physically mailed letters, phone messages, calls that I've been taking that have been aggressive and hostile. So these are not just angry or hated calls, but these are using expletives, name calling, anti-Semitic symbols and threatening. Um, I know these intense statements are from a very few uh, small minority. And I also, I want you to know that um, I, when I hear these strong, strongly worded uh, comments, they don't rep represent um, people with similar views. I really keep these separate. Um, and none of these comments have come from anyone that has a business in town. Um, business owners, we've had very good communication throughout the pandemic. But I just did believe that I wanted to identify this and let the board know it's been hard on the staff in the, in the health departments, affected the way we've worked, the way we've interacted at times with the public. And we've even been worried about um, being identified as being working for the health department. So I just wanna say, I don't, this, don't think this communication is acceptable. I don't think anyone here thinks that. Um, I don't think the health department should tolerate that, and I don't think we should tolerate this as a community. So I believe we are moving into a different time now, and this is passing, and we're moving beyond this. So I was trying to sort of think of something just to sort of summarize this and sort of finish on a positive note. And I did find a quote, and it is from Mindy Dom. Mindy, I don't know if you want to read it because I asked permission. Mindy, do you know what quote I'm talking about? I do, but you should go ahead. I don't have it in front of me. Thank you, Jennifer. Oh, okay. So this is from, from Mindy. Let's recommit to our connection and responsibility to each other. Recognize, not minimize harms our communities and vulnerable neighbors may face from the ongoing pandemic. Let's care for ourselves and others and be kind in these stormy times. Breathe in and breathe out. So thank you, Mindy. I thought that was a great way to sort of cap that. Thank you so much, Jennifer. You honor me by <laughs> this meeting. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mindy and Jennifer. I <laughs> yeah. did go to the health department and witnessed on um, February 23rd, and I know oh. you've been there several times. There's been a truck parked outside the health department, and I went in with the UMass students that was very derogatory um, to the health department and, and to people in town. And I'm also very much aware that in Massachusetts and around the country, many public health uh, employees and directors are resigning because of the pressure that they've been receiving. So thank you very much, Jen, for working and keeping your spirits up. And yeah. This and thank you, Mindy, for what you're doing um, more on our county and state level to move us forward. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank thank you. you. But if I can say thank you to all each of you because you're also the community volunteers that make our health policy um, sort of live for our community. And thank you to Jen and her staff. Incredible. But you're right. I mean, we live in. Um, unnecessarily polarizing times and public health is caught in that. And I, I really appreciate all of your work. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, our guest that came, Mindy. Um, so I'm moving into COVID-19 and I have items BCD. What I'm gonna do is start with testing. Um, this is just a brief um, notice that the Baker Polito administration is announcing they're shutting down a number of stop the spread testing sites. 
This is affecting UMass. Um, so they're still deciding what we're gonna do with the PCR program from UMass. But Amherst is receiving more of six, more rapid tests like we did before. 6,000 tests and they're coming next Wednesday to us as a, as a bridge. Um, so I think that's um, an, a topic that'll be ongoing. We'll find out more about the PCR testing at UMass. I don't have much more information. I don't know if anyone else does. I don't know if residents in town know that through um, the federal government, you can order and get four tests per household. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's another way to get. Um, Mindy, did you have something you want to say? I, just, can you I, hope, I hope it's okay if I just jump in here just to let you know that along with other legislators from Hampshire and Franklin counties, Senator Comerford and I are sending a letter this week to the secretary of Health and Human Services and the Commissioner of Health, urging them to reconsider closing the Amherst community test site. So in effect, allowing people to continue to pick up self-administered tests, PCR tests, and um, UMass continue to screen those and people continue to get the results. And we're asking them to continue to reconsider it and to continue the test site through the end of the semester. Um, you know, April 1st, quite frankly, I think, even though they gave us several weeks notice, is not a good time to close a community test site. I wanna remind everybody that rapid tests are great, except they do not perform a surveillance role. They don't get reported to the Department of Public Health, the data doesn't get collected, and it doesn't get shared with Jen or anybody else in the local health departments. So the PCR testing is great because it's free and it's available to Amherst and Western Massachusetts residents, anybody from Massachusetts. But it's also really important because it'll allow the health department to identify if there are any potential outbreaks that are happening and where, where they are. So that seems like an important um, tool to continue to have uh, available to us after spring break through the end of the semester. And I'll work with Jen to make sure that you're aware of um, what response, if any, we get. Um, I can't say I'm hopeful, but we're at least going to make the uh, effort to try to get it to stay open. That's great. Thank you, Thank you Mindy. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, everybody. And those are such valid points, Mindy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to move on to COVID-19 statistics. <clears throat> um, so Amherst, Hampshire County, and Massachusetts are experiencing a significant decline in the key COVID public health indicators. We've seen a decrease in the seven-day average COVID case count numbers, incidence rate, hospitalizations, and wastewater concentration. concentration. As of today, Amherst's active case count is 151. That's down from 536 a month ago. It is now the lowest it's been since late December. Our 14-day average incidence rate is today 70.25. Um, I just want to say that I calculated that myself. So the numbers are about to be released, or maybe they've been released already. So we'll see if that number is right. Um, that's down from 150 a month ago, and it's the lowest it's been since early January. Hampshire County wastewater concentration peaked end of December, and it's now where we were back in August. That data is from a DPH recommended site called Biobot. Um, at the same time, we have a high vaccination rate of 88%. Our local hospital bed capacity percentage is improving and is matching ICU and adult inpatient bed availability, similar to early December. Right now, our ICU bed capacity is 64%, 64.5%. And the adult is 75.3. The CDC now measures COVID community levels by the strain on hospital systems by looking at severity of sickness uh, expressed as hospitalizations, local bed capacity, which I just wrote, and the new case count. Also, I do want to point out that we're moving into warmer weather and better ventilation. In Amherst, we experienced an increase in the case numbers that are now declining. That was about three to four weeks ago. Um, the identified cases stayed mainly confined to the age groups of 17 to 22, mostly, and some with 22 to 27 year olds, with little spread into other age groups. Contact tracers 
report that Amherst cases were related to transmission, mainly in small groups. So these were social gatherings appropriate for this age group, um, sports clubs and small gatherings. Lastly, the high numbers were influenced by the availability of PCR testing in the community in higher ed institutions and identifying asymptomatic cases in individuals with mild symptom symptoms. Um, regarding the mask mandate, taking all that into consideration, I also wanna point out that we align ourselves with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and their updated mask guidance and the CDC restructured framework that measures COVID community levels and gives prevention strategies and puts us at a yellow medium transmission. Um, does anyone wanna add to the numbers or do you want me to go ahead with my recommendation? Maureen. I, thank you. I was, uh, I just checked on the website for the, the Massachusetts DPH and today's number was released just a little while ago and okay. it's down from um, 92, I think a week ago to 59.1. Oh, wow. So it, it has continued to, to decrease. I think that your calcul, you know, I think that's the equivalent of your calculation of 70 you know, sometimes I'm not sure which numbers are which, but I, the previous week was three weeks, two weeks ago was 150.8. Last week it was 92.4. Today is 59.1. And that's the 14 day incident rate. So it's really going in the a good direction. Thank you, Maureen. Nancy, do you want me to give my recommendation for the mask mandate, or does anyone else want to? Does anyone else have, uh, Mindy, do you have your hand up? No, I'm sorry, I'll lower it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> does anyone else so, have any question or comment? Uh, one, thing you didn't mention, one thing you didn't mention is BA2. What do, you, what do you know about that? Are you asking me, Steve? Well, in other words, yes, in other words, I just, you're talking about data. And so that's one thing that we might want to have in mind if there is some possibility of a very rapid increase due to BA2. You know, anything we do, if we change things, it's going to be harder to put it back. So I just wonder how, do you have any sense, are there any predictions from that you've heard about what's going to happen with BA2? No, but it's something that we definitely were thinking about back in June, you know, here we were, you know, in June and everything just felt great. And then in August, we started hearing about Delta. So this is part of what went into the on-ramping. And then we kept it because of Omicron. Um, right now, um, people are talking about BA2. I don't know what percentage is, is, you know, that's another reason that we need the surveillance. I, I just don't know if it's 20% in the States. I don't have that data. It's on the radar at DPH, we talk about it, but nothing's really being said where it is. But I agree, agree with, you know, in, in part what you're saying is like, here we are in a lull. It may be a lull, there may be another surge, we may have another variant, there may be another variant other than BA2. So I know I've heard people say it's really hard once you take a mandate away to put it back. I agree, but I think really we've been a great community figuring out how to work together. And if it comes to that and the numbers go up, if we decide to take the mass mandate away, I think if the numbers are there, it'll warrant taking a look at, at what we need to do, so. I don't know if anyone else has more information on BA2. I don't have much scientific, more just what's happening overseas and watching it. Yeah, that's a good point. Jennifer, can I ask one more question? A lot of people express concern about uh, spring break and travel, and I don't I don't have a memory long enough to remember if last year there was any bump or uh, uptick in the area after spring break. And I don't know if you would have any recollection of that or any data to see that. I did look at the curve from Hampshire County. It seemed to, seemed to have a little plateau perhaps at, at the right time to maybe be explained by that, but. But I, I, I understand those concerns. I just didn't know if we had any data to be to take that into account to, you know, I think um, 
anecdotally, it sounds like a nightmare, you know, that people are going everywhere and coming back with all kinds of different exposures and all like uh, sharing them again. But I don't know if that's really something we have to fear. So no. can I, yeah. oh, please add, address that. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, what is the positivity rate at UMass? So one concern is that it, that's coming up, you know, spring break is next week. Uh, and, and majority of the students are vaccinated in, in the sense that's a very high amount, like more than 97%. Um, and also the positivity rate of UMass was just released. It came in maybe 10, 15 minutes ago was 1.28. It's a very low positivity rate. So, uh, so I'm just, I'm just as, as curious, and I think Amherst in general has a positivity of uh, three point. I think is that Jennifer? Uh, three point? Oh no, two point three eight. Uh, from the C in, from the Mass website, you know, the public health website. Um, and I'm I'm just thinking about about the spring break and everything. So we had um, days which were primarily massless in a couple of days, and I think um, people, as I think one of the attendees was commenting that many students still wore mask um, and, and until they feel comfortable, you know. And so it was a really good thing to see, you know, that there is some sort of a uh, effort to self-protect themselves. Anything else? Uh, so, while Mindy's here, uh, I know the, the state has not been giving us vaccine rates by race or ethnicity. Mindy, is there any way we can get that? Do you know? <laughs> Joe and I have been fighting for this for a very long time to get lots of the data broken down mm -hmm. by race and ethnicity. Um, I'm happy to go back and re-ask the question um, this week as a result of this meeting and just prod them a little bit more. I don't know if we've, I don't know if the town has put that request in writing to the department or if it's just been verbally communicated. Um, I'm happy to take this as a sort of a request and I can work with Senator Comerford to make the request to the state and keep Jen apprised of what the response is. Would that be helpful? Do you yeah. want to make a formal vote on it that we would like the state to provide us? Um, I could make a motion that we would like the state to provide us with vaccine rates according to race and ethnicity for the town of Amherst. I'd love that quite okay, well, so personally, I just, I'll, personally, I'd love that because I have a bill and legislation in around vaccine equity with three other legislators, which would require that ultimately for the entire state. So, but I mean, I think I'm going to go ahead and do it, even without you passing a resolution. Well, so I think well, passing make, resolutions up to you. I'll make the motion that to look at uh, equity in vaccination rates that the town of Amherst would like the state to provide us with vaccine rates according to race and ethnicity. Would you like them to be um, overall, or would you like them to be by age? Oh. By age, okay, and if they do it by a census tract, I'd even love it by census tract. Um, um, put it in the resolution and we'll consider Okay, so we I would don't think they do it by census tract, but um, I think, Jen, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they do collect vaccine data by age, right? Because they're able to tell us what school age children's rates are. So. I wonder what I can get from my databases with the MIIS and, you know, color is our, our scheduling platform, what I'm able to pull. I think that's a great idea. We look at these, these numbers. Okay, well, I'll add to my motion by, uh, by age and if possible by census tract. Mm -hmm. I think that the age piece becomes really important, right? Because we mm -hmm. want to make sure. Yeah. So age, race, ethnicity, and if possible, census tract. Yeah. I just have a question, sorry. Um, uh, with this motion and um, asking the state for this data, what, what 
where would it come from? Like from the the data that we already have, how would it be different? Where where would it come from? So what right now we just have vaccine rate. So we don't have it by race and ethnicity. We don't have it by age group. So that's what we're asking for. And then if we could get by census tract, we could know if there's certain areas of town that have lower vaccination rates um, or higher vaccination rates. Did that answer your question, Lauren? Or Mindy, can you? I'm just, I think for the I'm most part. To clarify, I'm just trying to clarify from the the data that we already have and the update that was just given how would where where would the information come from would it come from the schools would it come from the hospitals i i'm just a little I, it seems like there there's a lot of places to retrieve data and i'm just wondering you know where would this new data come from I think, well, Jen might be able to answer this better, but I think that, um, hi, Lauren, it's good to see you. I'm glad you're on the board. Um, I think that um, the state collects this data already. They just, because they collect it when people get vaccinated. It's just that they haven't kind of separated out and shared it in a way that's usable by the board. But it wouldn't be coming from the school, it'd be coming from the Department of Public Health. And I think that's why Jen is suggesting that she has access to the vaccine database as a health official. So she may actually be able to tease it out and then separate it out by age. Um, but I still think it's worthwhile asking, but it's data that's already been collected that's voluntarily provided by people who are getting vaccinated. So for kids, it would be their parents mm -hmm. or guardians have voluntarily shared that information um, with the state. And so that's how it gets then ultimately into the database. Yeah, I can take a look at the, the MIIS, the Immunization Information System, um, and, and try to get that information. I can tell you it doesn't seem to cross, or maybe I'm wrong about this, but, but well into MAVEN, which is the Virtual Epidemiological Network. So I can't get the data, it's like if you've been positive with COVID, um, have you had all your vaccines? So I can't get, uh, per se, breakthrough cases in that data. But let me see what I can do. It's a great idea. So there is a compilation by the county, Hampshire County, by race and by age groups. Um, is that something, I mean, we, we wanted to have for that town, but I'm just curious if that county level data can be used by us, you know, in terms of assessing yeah. where we are, you know, in terms of race and age groups. Don't have access to other towns. But there again, it doesn't give us what's happening in our town and what we could possibly do or act on with that data. It's, it's too general. So the more specific data, the more, so if, if, if we saw certain age groups or certain something have high vaccination rates, we wouldn't want to set up more, you know, do clinics, but we could also do very spot um, clinics or do more expl exploration on education in providing vaccines um, to any specific group if the data come, tells us that. You know, I just want to give a shout out to Northampton and the Public Health Excellence Grant and how we're talking about more regionalization. They have an immunization team there that I'm speaking with. So we're already talking about, even though we're doing clinics, but how can we do it regionally um, and really go to, to places that we haven't been able to. So it's something that we talk about, but I, I like the momentum and getting it going. So we'll see what we get for next month. More data. Anything else, Jen? Are you actually <clears throat> making a motion, uh, Nancy? Oh, yeah. I want to make, yeah. yes, I made the motion. We didn't vote on it. <laughs> Why do we have a second? I'll second. I'll second the motion. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
The motion's been made and seconded um, to get increased data on vaccine rates. So Steve. Hi. Tim. Hi. Maureen. Hi. Lauren. Lauren. Hi. And Nancy, aye. So it's been moved and voted on. So there, Mindy, take it to the state. I love it. Thank you. I'm a big believer in um, we don't know unless we see, and data helps us see. So um, it's like very key to, it's key to our ability to actually be responsive. So thank you so much. Thank you. OK. Um, back to you, Jen. Okay, so mask mandate update, I'm gonna continue on. So I gave the data and I'm gonna make the recommendation to lift the mask mandate in Amherst. Um, that's my recommendation. I'd like to hear from the board. I would ask that be lifted immediately. Um, today's March 10th, 2022. And this would result in the Amherst Regional Public Schools and their mask ma mandate being lifted Monday, March 14th, 2022. Can, presumably the, the schools have, can do what they want to some extent, right? Or do, are, they can. How, um, do you know they can. That they, are they okay with March 14th? It's quite soon. I would want to give them all the flexibility they might need. Um, Mike Morris, the superintendent, and I um, have, have spoken throughout the weeks I just, you know, plural, just back and forth with this, you know. Thank you, I appreciate that, it's true. That's my recommendation, and I just uh, want the board to, you know, weigh in and want to hear. Maureen? Hi, um, I support the recommendation, but I have some concerns for those who are at risk, um, either elderly or um, immunosuppressed or both. And I wonder what uh, resources we have to support those folks um, in terms of testing, access to treatments, which are now available like Paxlovid, because those things have to be done in a timely way. You need to test quickly, you need to treat quickly. And I don't know what's available in our community to help us to do that, um, whether it's through Cooley Dickinson or the pharmacies or whatever. But that's a, a really important piece. The other thing I think is to have people have ease, better access to higher quality masks and maybe with some help and even choosing one that fits well, um, because um, because they're going to need to protect themselves. And I, I don't, I think there's going to be a long time that COVID will be with us and that will be necessary for people. Um, it's not a matter of weeks. I think it's a matter of, you know, of a long, you know, months or more, who knows what's going to happen. But, but I think whenever we pull back on the man mask mandate, we're going to have this issue. And I, I just wonder how prepared we are. Oh, I think these are great points, Maureen. And, you know, I, I wrote about this. I just wanted to sort of stay what, you know, I was recommending. But I think it's it's really important that we acknowledge that a lot of people um, are going to be very concerned about their health, immunocompromised, other health issues. They're worried about their health. They're worried about bringing it to somebody else. They're protecting their loved ones. Um, wearing a mask might just be comfortable. Um, but we know that you know, well-fitted, high filtration masks are very effective. And I agree, um, you know, how can we talk about get, making sure people have those? I have some access. Um, I know there's other programs that can get them. I think ventilation is a huge topic we need to talk about. Is there any, a business or anybody that wants us to come in and actually speak about that? Um, other thing, Maureen, I was gonna talk to you you know, another time, I don't think this works, but I agree with you about the testing. You know, there, some people are calling it test to treat. So let's say we have these 6,000 antigen tests. So don't come in the building, but we can, I mean, I, I don't know if this is gonna work, um, test people outside. If you're positive, let's talk about what needs to do be done. You have to wear a mask still, um, but, but who can be a prescriber to, to get people the prescription to get the Pax, is it Paxlovid, 
uh, rent disappear. Yeah, yeah need, that's one of them. Um, quickly, it's free at CVS, but you need a you need a, a prescription. So I don't know how we can do this, but I know we can figure it out. You know. Well, yeah, I think that's important in in this transition period. That's smart. Thing. Uh, does CVS have a prescriber through their minute clinic that can prescribe, but then that adds a cost? Um, yeah, and clinic. sorry, I didn't mean to over talk you. Yeah. You know, I really like the CDC new guidance, um, but they say somewhere, and I'm not going to be able to find it, but it says something like talk to your provider if you feel like you should still be wearing a mask. But not everyone has health insurance and not everyone right. has a provider. Um, right. So let's really make sure, you know, these populations that are really hard hit, um, let's make sure that they're really supported. Um, so I think looking at the vaccine, that's a real beginning. Um, but right, so Nancy, I mean, I like your thinking. How can we get these, these meds into people's hands? Yeah, and if you use that minute clinic, mm -hmm. Oh, that's a big box. Um. Um, I had a question, a clarifying question about um, if the mandate is lifted, the mask mandate is lifted, how that would affect the schools, which a lot of um, the public has um, concerns both ways. And so you said you spoke to the superintendent. Have they made it clear as to what they will be doing they'll, they'll be ma making they're they're making a decision you know for their community based on what's going on there and and our decision affects affects the town yes so will the schools give the choice for children to either wear masks if they want to or not wear masks that's yeah i mean lauren that's another thing that oh i'm sorry i didn't mean to over talk you again i'm doing that um that's another thing that you know i think is really important that people are, are are you know pointing out you know we're really moving into this different phase um <clears throat> it's personal responsibility but also it's community and how do we support each other you know i really think this is a great a great town community we live on and just be really considerate of people's choices of wearing masks so people can continue to wear masks businesses can continue to make more strict um, decisions for their population um, but that answer the question that yes children can continue to wear masks I'm, I'm asking how how is that going to be communicated? How how is the schools going to communicate that? You know, I I don't know. They have newsletters. I know they're great communicators. I just um, specifically it'll be multi channels. I oh, I'm just confident. I'll get the word out. Uh, <clears throat> could I say I do support. Uh, lifting the mandate. And I do want to mention another group, that's the kids under five who can't be vaccinated. Now, I know we've heard from parents who say that they want masks requirements eliminated because of they, what they consider to be social development effects. Um, but also it makes the children vulnerable. And I know that's a legitimate concern. And I know we shouldn't dismiss even, a, even any number of deaths, people have gotten into trouble saying, well, only so many people die. I do think from what I can see, the risk of serious illness and death in very young children is small. I see that since the pandemic started in early 2020, eight times as many kids under five have died by motor vehicles than have died by COVID. Every death is a tragedy, but we take those risks. There's lots of things we could do to prevent those 800 deaths. We could ban all cars and trucks, or we could have a governor so no car could go over 25 miles an hour. We don't do that. And I think that although it is true that those kids under age five are going to be more at risk, a little bit more at risk if we eliminate that mask requirement for others, I think the, the effect of it is very small. The masks have don't eliminate all of those cases, and 
overall, when you see the very great drop in number of cases locally and nationally, I think that on balance, it's legitimate to lift it, according to what you said, Jennifer, in other words, right now. Just to add to Stephen's comments, I agree. Uh, uh, I mean, below five, uh, even though in, in general they have a low uh, uh, impact in terms of death rates or something, but I would like the schools and the parents uh, decide based on individual requirements. So, for example, we need that choice made to the parents. You know, so if a parent prefers that, they know that child really well. Um, so and so I, I think uh, by lifting it and giving the choice to the parents, I think it's a good thing to do. I was concerned of what was going to happen to the rates, especially with children um, after the February vacation week and numbers did not go up. Um, so that made me feel um, much better. I thought that might have been a, a, a possible spreading um, event with, with travel, but it didn't come to fruition. And most of our positive testing is in that um, 17 to 22 age group, followed by 22 to 27. And then I, I did look at the Cooley Dickinson beds. And in, the, in January and February, uh, Jan, uh, December and January, they were having 23 to 26 beds uh, with COVID patients. And since the beginning of February, there were five, four, then three, 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 two, and three. So the numbers at Cooley Dickinson from the end of January, beginning of February have come radically down for our hospital um, COVID cases. They didn't have ICU beds and uh, Jen did provide us with the uh, uh, bed capacity earlier. And even the waste <laughs> One other thing that we could do perhaps is to make sure that people are aware of something that has happened in a few other towns. And that is that some businesses have set aside a few hours each day or in certain schedule where the businesses require masks, which of course they're perfectly free to do all the time, but most of them will probably not require them in town if we don't, but businesses could provide an hour or something where everybody will have to be masked if there's a lot of public concern about exposure. Just a th entirely up to them. Uh, I was just gonna add, I, I, I my biggest, I, I know there's the businesses, there's the public um, areas like the um, PVTA, well, people who use public um, transportation and so forth, and um, other public spaces where, you know, people are, are in close connection with, with each other. But my um, main concern is the schools, and I just would not want you know, the um, Board of Health to, to not be on the same page or it doesn't seem like we're on the same page with the, the schools um, and the superintendent. So is this something that we are doing together? As you said that you spoke to the superintendent so that there's not a conflict and people don't see it as a conflict. I, you know, I, oh, yeah, oh, so <laughs> we, Mike Morris and I speak and we, we go back and forth with data and guidance and where we are. Um, and so there, there's no conflict between us. We, I have to say we work really well together, the school system and the health department, the town. So lots of good communication. So most other schools in Hampshire County have lifted it or are lifting it in the next week or two. Um, so I've been watching what was happening to other school districts. 
Um, if we do continue with lifting it, I know people um, know that there's still requirements in certain locations. Um, we'll put them up on the, the web page. But for example, on um, the bus, the MBTA, and also private lift services such as Uber, healthcare facilities, the nurse's office at the schools, congregate settings and shelters. Um, and also if people are sick, you still need to be isolating with a mask on, but we can put the full list up. It is up on DPH. And even if we list it, we will be watching the data. We will be watching for variants. We will keep revisiting it. We'll watch the CDC and we can always have an emergency meeting if it comes before our scheduled yep. meeting to put it back in place. Yeah, I think that's really smart. I know it, it, it's, it's so mixed, but people, and we have to repeat, respect people who still wear masks and all, still wear a mask going and go grocery shopping. Mm -hmm. um, um, but when, <laughs> I don't go out to eat, but when I think of it, I think, okay, you wear your mask into a restaurant, then you take it down. So everybody's sitting there with it off and then you put it on to walk out of the restaurant. Um, I haven't been doing that, but it seems like, well, you know, is this mask really protecting you in a restaurant at this point? Um, as I said, I've chosen not to go out to restaurants. Put on this or just that we're accepting that my recommendation is the health director. Okay. Can we have a motion to... <laughs> Steve, you're making the emotion? No, I was just saying, yes, we do, because we've put it in with a motion. We should take it off with a motion, for sure. Yeah. I thought it went. About is, how is it going to be with the schools? What do we say in the motion about the schools? I don't know. The schools are, OK, Jen, clarify this. But the schools and the school committee can make their own decisions, correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, but like I said, this is, this is uh, the superintendent and I talking about that date. Um, and it's not one he's picked arbitrarily. It's a lot of communication and people talking. So. so in our motion, should we just say that the book that we are um, ending the mask mandate as of today and then not say anything about what the schools decide to do? Okay. I just asked that the mandate went in you. I thought the authority was given to me. You voted to give me the authority. I'm fine either way, but I just wanted to clarify thinking back. This is back in August. I, the, I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine with a vote. I think, you know, I, I like, I like, it's good government. It's nice and clear. Everyone's contributing. So. Yeah, so that you said it, Maureen. What did you say? Yeah. What? You made the motion. What was it? <laughs> Well, I don't know if I actually did. I was actually oh, I asking a question, but I guess I move um, to end the mask mandate in indoor spaces in Amherst as of today, March 10th, 2022. I second it. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded to remove the mask mandate. Um, all Would it have to say, I'm sorry. Wouldn't have to say public something about the public spaces. I thought I did indoor public spaces. No, you just I just said, you indoor. Just said indoor space. Yeah. Okay, to be public. Yeah, you had said that morning. So we have the motion, and it's been seconded. Correct, Tim. You seconded yeah, it. Yeah, I seconded it. It's been moved and seconded. Now we will vote on it, Tim. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Steve. Aye. Lauren. Aye. Indoor public spaces. Okay. And Nancy. <laughs> aye. Okay. So we have lifted the mask mandate. I guess we can only lift it where it was implied. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, Okay, anything else? I'm all set, thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. Good, good input.
and suggestions and paths forward. Okay, so we will and, now. And Jen, I'd be happy to talk with you more about what we talked about. Thank you. I love I love that idea. Yeah. Okay, so now we will open up the public comment once again. Nancy, may I ask you how long are we going to do public comment? Um, I just just to start off with the the guide. We did twenty before. Is it going to be? Um, oh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't disconnect that phone. Um, I. 10 minutes and if we really have a we could extend it to okay. 10 minutes so it's 6 30 so to 6 40 6 30 so 6 40 and we'll get my okay so we are opening it up for public comments okay. once again so um i'm gonna call on people i'd like to hear their full name i see a website um that does not have a person's name so if i'm gonna call them Inner Glow Wellness, if you can state your full name. And I think we really need to ask people for their street addresses. Okay. So Inner Glow Wellness, can you please give us your name and where you live? And you can Yes. Know. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. All right. My name is Jennifer Larson. I live at 38 Fearing Street in downtown Amherst. I am so thrilled to hear what you just voted, which basically makes most of my points moot because you all agreed but I will go ahead and share my thoughts anyway. Um, there was some concern over whether people will still feel comfortable wearing masks. I think using the term mask optional may be helpful because lifting a mask mandate doesn't mean everybody's going to take them off. I wanted to con comment about PCR testing. Last year in July, the CDC let uh, the public know that PCR tests would have six more months to be admitted. And then by the end of 2021, the, their determination was that there's a high rate of false positives and an inability to discern between the flu and COVID. And it was recommended that laboratories use a different type of testing. I'm very happy that you went ahead and agreed with the support of other major agencies like DESE, Department of Public Health and the CDC on lifting these mandates. I moved here eight months ago from a state that does not have mask mandates. I moved here from Florida. They've been doing that a long while already with no spikes in cases. Um, those who feel at risk have plenty of opportunity to access vaccines and boosters or can do, participate in one way masking. I'm also gonna comment on prevention. There is a study that links low vitamin D levels with severe outcomes for COVID. So if people take vitamin D, they have a better chance of having less severe COVID. The effects on children have been very detrimental wearing masks, effects on speech development, literacy, social skills, dental issues, restricted oxygen, empathy. The young should not be suffering for the portion of the population that is more at risk. The young are the, at the lowest risk and being in school, it's a controlled environment. It seems that in this community, the goal is to have zero cases of COVID and that is not realistic. Even the vaccine that we have only time limits the severity. Minutes is up. So thank you so much you for your time. A, okay, thank you very much. Okay, Carlo Della Pacillo, I'm so sorry. If you can please, let's see. Oh, okay, the hand went down. Cole Fitzpatrick, if you can state um, your name correctly and where you live, your address. Yep. You Hello. Hello, I'm Cole Fitzpatrick. I'm on 32 Trillion Way. I'll keep this really short because uh, I was happy with the way you voted. Um, just want to commend you all. It, it takes courage um, to make the decision that you did. Um, I really appreciate you guys following the science and following the guidance rather than emotion. Um, so just kudos to everyone. Uh, it's been a tough job the last two years. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for responding to all my emails over the past couple of months. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Cole. Thank you. Carlo, if you can spell your, um, say your full name and where you live, please. You have two minutes. Yes. Um, Thanks for trying to pronounce my name. Carlo, De <laughs> that's okay. Carlo Della Piccola. I spell it D A L L A P I C C O L A. My 
town address is 12 Pine Hollow, Amherst. I have uh, two children in the public school system. And uh, like the other commenters, I'm changing my comment because I was going to ask that uh, you consider lifting the mandate, which you've already done. So I applaud you for that. I'm, I'm very uh, excited about that. I would like to note, uh, I was really struck by the, the very thoughtful, rational, um, very reasonable uh, dialogue that you have with each other. I'm very sorry to hear about the, the horrible uh, comments you have to uh, deal with via mail, et cetera. Um, so maybe one thing I could add is uh, I would be a little bit cautious in my opinion about the idea of yo-yoing back and forth uh, the mask mandate. I think there will be upticks in cases for a very long time. We're gonna have holidays, July 4th, spring break, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, uh, the, the school breaks, uh, UMass, uh, homecoming. And you know, it, it, those things will, will generally resolve themselves. I think the main thing is the very high vaccination rates and uh, population immunity levels. And it, I think it's the right moment to make this decision and to uh, get back, take one more step to, towards normalcy for our, our, our mental health. Uh, so uh, thank you guys. I, I think this is a, a great day for Amherst. Thank, thank you, Carla. All right, Heath Hatch, if you can unmute yourself, please. State where you live, you have two minutes. Yes, I'm Heath Hatch. I live at 66 Flathills Road here in Amherst. Um, I want to thank you for making the decision. I am partially hearing impaired, and so I can finally communicate better now, being able to read lips, and it's been a challenge for a long time. to have lost that ability, and so I appreciate it. That I know I'm not the only one, so I appreciate the courage it takes to and that's all I just want to say. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Heath. We have Claudia Pasmani. If you can state your name, where you live, if you're a business owner, and you have two minutes. Hi, I'm Claudia Pasmani, Executive Director of the Amherst Area Chamber, and also at, um, just to reveal that, and I'm at uh, 47 Emily. Emily Lane and Amherst. And I just wanna thank you so much for all your hard work. Thank you for this vote. Um, I share Gabrielle's earlier comments on this, this, the challenge of all of our businesses and what it's been for their employees and so forth. And the ability just to continue, as Tim had mentioned earlier about even in Hadley, when they lifted the mask mandate, people continue to wear masks as they would like and at their comfort level. Um, and it seems like it's such, there just seems to be so much less stress um, for everyone involved. And it's just been that so much stress. But I also want to commend you and the town because the town has done an extraordinary um, support with, through the ambassador program, the Amherst ambassadors, and they have been incredible on the ground and trying to help and, and keep, you know, keep people um, informed as well. So they've been great an extension of, of, you know, these mandates and keeping, you know, everyone supported. And so we are continuing to be here to support but um, we're also really ready to see our businesses, you know, make that call for themselves and move forward. So, and hopefully we won't see the spike that, you know, who knows, we've all been learned to pivot, but um, I'm really hoping that this is one last pivot in, in the right direction. So thank you for all your hard work, but I really appreciate you looking at the science and these low cases and some of the data that you shared today um, continues to inform us that this is the right move at the right time. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think, I think that's the end of that's it. raised yeah. hands. Okay. Um, I have no more topics. Our next meeting will be April 21st and we will have the hearing. Jen, when will we be able to meet in person? So next month is gonna be remote. We're going to keep yeah. that, yeah. Um, and then um, the uh, the DA or the Attorney General, uh, I apologize, uh, has extended the ability for us to remain remote until July fifteenth. So okay. this we're going to be remote next month, but we're going to the town is making some decisions. Um, 
in that meantime about how we're going to proceed. So we don't have that information. But I think that was interesting. I, I think the resident was Heath. I, I apologize if that's wrong, but I think he he commented that uh, this this platform was was beneficial to him. Um, we sure have had a lot pe more people participate remotely. So anyhow, I don't know what the answer is. Nancy, how do you feel about Zoom meetings? Uh, pros and cons. Yeah. Um, the pros are it opens it up to many more residents. Um, also, if any board member needs to travel, the board member can still participate. The cons are I really like the interpersonal interaction. So um, and after our last meeting, um, I got several emails so that if there are any comments about medical treatment or what you should be doing or not doing related to any health illness or COVID, please check with your provider and the information that's given by individuals um, may not be accurate. Um, so please use your primary care provider in making a decision on what over-the-counter medication or other medication that you may be taking. Whoops, man, my two minutes is up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, thank you all. Um, and we'll need a motion to adjourn. Can I make a, a quick suggestion? And I'd like to say something after you, Tim, after you, thank you. Uh, you mentioned about the Zoom meetings and I, I would recommend bringing it a hybrid. That means have a Zoom cam right in our meeting so that more people can participate and interact. Um, just a hybrid method, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's that's something we're looking at. So hybrid, would it be in, you know, if the bank, if you know the bank center in one of the rooms, is it one camera so you can see everyone as a panel member or do people have separate? And, but just how to do hybrid, is it difficult or is it not difficult? But I, I like that idea, Tim. Have to, I, I, there's been a lot of discussion with it over the um, town council meeting and that that oh. is adequate. So what rooms available in the town that have that um, ability and can we access that for use? But yes, that would be very good. So, you know, I just want to say that tomorrow we'll put up messaging um, on our website first thing um, with sort of more educational pieces and uh, links to important places. So things that we didn't cover today will be available tomorrow. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you, Mindy, for attending. Um, Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you for the attendees. Um, and thank you to the board and Jen and may have a motion to adjourn. I can make a motion to adjourn to this meeting. We have a motion, may have a second. I'll second it. Steve second it. So all uh, a vote. Steve? Aye. Maureen? Maureen? Adjourning? I don't know if she can hear me. She's oh. saying hi. She's saying hi. Saying hi. Okay. Uh, Tim? Aye. Say aye. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Lauren? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. So thank you. And we will see each other on the uh, 21st. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thank you once again, Jen. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, the recording.